Country Diggers here. Today I'm going to do some more uh, family history, genealogy stuff. Today we're going to do it on Captain Thomas Crawford. And this is an article in old.scotswars.com. It's a Scottish military history and reenactment. So I'm going to read the article in that about Thomas Crawford. And uh, I'll show you some pictures from um, <clears throat> where Thomas, he, uh, he was the one who scaled the walls of Dunbarton Castle where Mary Queen of Scots was taking refuge at that castle. And he scaled the walls of it, and I'll show you some pictures of Dumbarton Castle. And um, it's going to be very interesting, so stay tuned. Captain Thomas Crawford, Laird of Jordan Hill, the Battle of Pinky. The Scottish troops had thrown down so many pikes that the battlefield of Pinky looked like a wood yard. Most of the pikemen were dead or had run away. The rest, like young Thomas Crawford, were wounded, waiting for the English to cut their throats or take them prisoner. It would be a very quick end to his career if his first battle proved to be his last, thought Thomas. If he lived, he would always remember the Battle of Pinky, February 10th, 1547 as a lesson in how not to carry on a fight. Everything had gone wrong. He blamed the Scottish commander most of all. The Duke of <clears throat> Chatterler Halt. Now, I might not say these words right, but you get the gist, I hope. Okay. Regent of Scot he was the Regent of Scotland, this Duke was had begun by lining up his army in a safe position on Edmonston Edge. This is a steep piece of ground above the River Esk. On their right was a marsh, and on their left the sea beach, where they had dug trenches and set up cannon. The Scottish pikemen had formed into Sildertrons, each compromising 64 men with the spar points, spear points bristling in all directions like the spines of a hedgehog. All they had to do was wait for the English to charge. Horses and riders would be spiked on top, would be spiked on the sharp points long before they got within sword distance. And then the Scots would counterattack with pike, dirk, claymore, and pistol. Instead, the Duke had decided to charge the English first. Down the slope went the Earl of Huntley's men with a swarm of Highland bowmen on the flank near the sea. The Scots had soon realized their mistake. The great salvo of cannonballs ripped into the charging Highlanders. It had come from the English fleet anchored in the bay, where the ship's gunners were loading and firing as fast as they could. At such shot range, with the ships lying in calm waters, they could not miss. <clears throat> The first ranks of Highlanders were blown to bits, and the rest fled. The rest of the army had then tried to form up into Sildertrons. I don't know what this word is. It's S-C-H-I-L-T-R-O-N-S. But they, too, were smashed by cannon fire from the English batteries ahead and from the great ship's guns on the left. Those who had managed to plant their pike butts in the ground and make up their hedgehogs had to face new dangers. Many English foot soldiers were armed with um, arquebuses, A-R-Q-U-E-B-U-S-S-E-S, -S -S -S, okay? And they fired at close range into the tightly packed squares 
when the cannons stopped firing, troops of English cavalry attacked. Some some had circles circled the Skitteron uh, out of range of the spear points, shooting down the spikemen, firing and loading as they galloped. Now, um, I can imagine this. I don't... Uh, for some reason, I don't know what a, a Skitteron is, or if I'm even saying it right, which I don't think I am, but I can imagine it. But anyway, uh, soon gaps had formed in the bristling hedges of spears, and the English commander ordered the rest of his cavalry to charge. There were 4,000 of them. The gentlemen uh, pensioners of the royal bodyguard, the northern horse from the borders, and a host of foreign horsemen too. The Scottish leaders had realized that they were beaten as the mass of English cavalry charged among the broken skitterons. Uh, the Duke of Chattel Hersot, I don't know what this uh I don't know what the word is. It's C-H-A-T-E-L, chattel, her, H-E-R, alt, A-U-L-T, chatterhalt. That's it, chatterhalt, I think. Had been one of the first to ride off with shouts of treason as he went, and the rest of the army were left to the mercy of the English. Home to Dumry. Drumry. <clears throat> Hours later, propped up in a lurching uh, automation wagon with other wounded gentlemen groaning as the, the wheels jaunted over the rough track, Thomas began to realize that it was not only bad leadership that had lost the battle, they had been beaten at Pinky because they were short of cannon fire, arms, and cavalry, and because they were not trained to think as soldiers. The English had captured 1,500 prisoners at Pinky. Thomas was one of the lucky ones. His wounds soon healed, and his father was able to pay his ransom. So it was not long before Thomas was riding back home to his father's house at Drumry, wondering about the future. Thomas is Lawrence Crawford's sixth son, and though, and though it is customary for landowners to leave estates to their sons, it is unlikely that Thomas will inherit enough to make a living. It is for this reason that at 17, Thomas decides he must make his own career. Uh, and Thomas was the sixth son, so uh, he was low on the totem pole to inherit anything. Okay. One way is to become a soldier. And though his first battle had not been very successful, he knows that there are plenty of openings for an active man. Scotland and France have been friendly for hundreds of years. And the kings of France have whole regiments of Scottish soldiers. Indeed, it was Scottish archers who marched alongside Joan of Arc as she read, uh, rode in triumph at, to uh, Reims after beating the English in 1428. With plans for his future in his head, Thomas makes his way westward following the old track that the Romans first made to Old Kilpatrick. Just past Castle Hill, he turns down to the steep road that winds through Pill Glen over the narrow bridge and up the hill towards the Pill Tower of Drumry. His father built the tower uh, home in 1530, in the year that Thomas was born. It stands on high ground so that a sentry looking out from it can see the hamlet of Drumry and a vast expanse of green fields and marshes beyond. 
more on the pill tower of Drumry. The three-story building is more like a castle than, than a house. Corbelled tor turrets swell out at each corner on the slated roof, and the only breaks in the massive stone walls are narrow slits. A barmkin wall surrounds the courtyard, pierced by gun, po gun ports and loopholes. A sentry in the northwest turret sees Thomas coming up the hill, and as he rides up, he finds the courtyard gate open and the two doors that guard the entrance to the tower unlocked. The outside door has an outer skin of thick oak planks running vertically and an inner skin of planks laid across diagonally. Huge iron nails, nail heads on the outside. The inner door is an iron grill and if any attacker does manage to break down the outer door, he will find the inner, inner yelt an even harder obstacle. The inner yelt an even harder obstacle. The doors lead into a big vaulted room used as a storehouse and a stable in times of danger. To reach the hall or living room, Thomas has to climb a circular stair with uneven treads, holding the newest post with his right hand, nearest post with his right hand. A single spearman can hold off a whole army of enemies trying to climb that staircase. As he climbs, Thomas thinks of the last time he stumbled up the narrow steps on the heels of the messenger who had brought the fiery cross just before the Battle of Pinky. The messenger had hidden in with a crowd of horsemen to bring the news that every man and boy between the ages of 60 and 16 was together at Musselburgh. Thomas had looked with awe at the messenger and his staff with the red painted saltire on top. Anybody who disobeyed its command would be outlawed. That night, the hall had been full of exciting men. The fiery cross was, um, just like it says, a fiery cross. Um, they set it up as a message to all the clans to come and meet. And um, that's one, one of the... Um, um, things that, in America... When, they, when the Scottish came to America, they think that um, the Ku Klux Klan, they think they are the ones who actually um, adopted the fiery cross for what they did. Now, the fiery cross wasn't supposed to be like that. The fiery cross was just a uh, cross burning because they wanted the clans to meet the scottish clans to meet not the kkk not the ku klux klan uh, actually uh the ku klux klan adopted things that were from other cultures that weren't supposed to be in their stuff uh, they adopted it for evil and anyway that's another whole history there. Okay. That night, the hall had been full of exciting men, anxious to hear the news and full of confidence, full of excited men, anxious to hear the news and full of exciting... Okay, here I go. Uh, uh, for the coming battle with the English. On this evening, after the excitement of his return is over, he finds the horse house much quieter, and at the evening meal, there are empty places and sadder voices. The Crawfords and their retainers and servants all eat together in the same upstairs hall. The family sit at a linen-covered table at the end of the room 
with a piece of of rather faded tapestry behind them to take off the chill in the room. While his family are seated on cushioned stools, the other men of the household sit on long benches, set against the walls, and eat from trestle tables that can be folded up at the end of the meal. The only furnishings are an armory to hold the pewter dishes and the great silver salt flat, a nig, I think it's, it is, N-I-G, a rug, rug, okay, rug, I can't even read my own writing, okay, <laughs> a rug before the blazing fire, a spinning wheel in the corner, and a stand of armor all. The men eat heartily, spooning up oatmeal porridge, and as special, as a special treat, a ladle full of stewed meat. They push aside their plaids because the room is hot, but each wears his blue bonnet. It is most impolite to eat uncovered, for their long shaggy hair is none too clean. <laughs> the Crawfords eat more elegantly, the main course being a dish of pullets served with prunes, and they drank French wine instead of ale. As they wrench their fingers after the meal, Thomas tells his father of his desire to go abroad. Lawrence Crawford likes the idea. There are plenty of Crawfords serving at the French court and among the French armies, and he is keen that his youngest son should see the manners and customs of a different country. He decides to arrange for Thomas to serve in some great noble's household until he is able to win a post in the Scottish Guards. <clears throat> this is a special, the Scottish Guards is a special regiment which was started in 1442 by King Charles the five, six, seven, King Charles the seventh of France. One branch of the regiment consists of the men at arms who are a special chosen group. Each man at arms has to be a gentleman by birth and an expert at fighting on horseback and on foot, and each has a following of foot soldiers. Another branch of the regiment is made up of archers, who are very often the younger brothers of the men at arms, waiting for their turn to be promoted to lance or man at arms. If Thomas can become a member of the uh, Scottish, uh, Scottish Arms, it, it's called something else in Fran French, uh, G-N, oh, excuse me, G-E-N-D-A-R-M-E-S, um, E-C-O, two words right there, okay, E-C-O-S-S-A-I-S. Uh, and it just means Scottish guards in French. Okay. Uh, for men of lesser rank, there are other regiments too, such as the Scottish Light Cavalry, made up of Highlanders, mounted on small, fast ponies. They wear their native costume, and the French sometimes make fun of their red bonnets, plaids, high boots, and shaggy beards. They do not dare do so to their faces. Yeah. <laughs> However, for the Scottish Light Cavalry are feared on battlefields all over Europe. Apart from becoming a highly trained soldier, Thomas may gain other advantages from becoming a Scottish Guard, a man-at-arms fighting for the King of France might win great rewards, such as a pension, pension or an estate. France is a rich country, and there are many French nobles whose forefathers have come from Britain. The Count de Orlan Khan, for example, D slash O-I-L 
No, D, comma, up on top. What's that called? Apostrophe. D, D, apostrophe, O-I-L-E-N-C-O-M, I think. This is what it is. Okay. For example, is descended from an ordinary soldier called Williamson. Off to France. It is not love. It is not long. Excuse me. Can't read my writing. It is not long, therefore, before Thomas finds himself on the road to Leith, riding one of his father's best saddle horses, while a servant mounted on a rough pony holds the leading rein of a pack horse. Thomas's sea, ch sea chest, full of new clothes, is balanced across its panniers. Um, they soon arrive in Glasgow, which is especially busy for it is Tuesday and the market is in full swing. Farmers and traders come in from all parts of Scotland to sell goods here. Beyond Glasgow, the road takes them on to Edinburgh, past Lithingale, um, and its royal palace. There is no royalty staying there now, for the Queen Mother, Mary of Guise, Lorraine, Leaves either, lives either in Edinburgh or Stirling. The going is rough, for the roads are mere tracks. Thomas is relieved when they finally reach Edinburgh and make their way to Leith. Here they find the gallery that is to get the galley that is to take Thomas to France and receive a warm greeting from the captain. Thomas, exhausted from his journey, stumbles up, stumbles to his cabin where he peels off his tight doublet, hangs his feathered hat on a hook, and stretches out happily on the narrow bank, bunk. Within minutes, he is fast asleep. The sound of a drum beating out a steady rhythm wakes him up, and he looks out the door of the poop cabin to see the um, towers and roofs, roofs of Leith gliding away into the mist. Below him, as he looks towards the prow, he can see rolls of oarsmen tucking, tugging at the heavy sweeps, keeping time to the throb of the drum. The overseers pace along the catwalk, long whips in their hands, ready to urge on any slave who does not pull his weight or loses the rhythm. The oarsmen are convicts. The uh, slaves and oarsmen are convicts uh, sent by the laws of France to serve in the galleys and are rowing, rowing hard enough now. But they will tire later. They will be grateful... They will be, be grateful if a favorable wind rises and the great square sail can be hoisted. The four-day journey passes very quickly and it seems no time at all before Thomas is at the palace of St. Germain, uh, clutching his letters of introduction and rolling a little in his walk as he marches along the great quarters. He is greeted by one of his cousins, who had been at the French court for some time, and before long the two young men are exploring the palace together. Excuse me. <clears throat> at, the at the court of France, he has seen nothing like this place before. Scottish nobles and, and even Scottish kings and queens live in grim castles with nothing to hide the bare stones uh, but an odd tapestry on the wall and a handful of rushes on bent grass on the flags. Here it is, here it is different. It seems that France is so peaceful a country that the nobility no longer need to hide behind drawbridges, porticles, and battlements. They have learned to build houses for comfort rather than strength. Underfoot is a mosaic of polished tiles, and on either side the smoothly plastered 
and painted walls are decorated with huge colorful tapestries and paintings. In the vestibules are statues of marble and decorations of silver and gold. Thomas stares in amazement at the luxuries surrounding as his cousin leads him through the palace. Suddenly he is pushed against the wall and told to bow low. The French royal family and a group of countries, uh, courtiers are passing along the quarters. First came the men of the Scottish guard, the Scottish bodyguards, and Thomas is thrilled to recognize among them another of his Crawford cousins. Um, just a side note here, we have a lot of cousins. <laughs> I mean, I I do have a, a lot of cousins on my father's side, which is the Crawford side. Um, I don't really know how many cousins I have. <laughs> but my grandmother was the old woman in, uh, that lived in the shoe, you know. <laughs> she had so so many grandchildren, she didn't know what to do. And that was true. Okay. The guards are splendidly dressed with white satin surcoats that glitter with silver and a crown and the crescent moon, the special emblem of King Henry II. The surcoat has a high collar and with uh, equilates, epilates, epilates, I think, E-P-A-U-L-E-T-S. Anyway, they march down the quarter with great dignity, soldiers, uh, so, shoulders back and heads in the air, their eyes stern and hard beneath the steel brims of their tall plumed helmets. They are armed with enormous halberds, and they seem to Thomas to be the tallest, broadest, and most, most magnificent soldiers he has ever seen. Behind them comes the king, Henry II. He is tall, broad, athletic, and paces along with an energy, uh, easy step. His is completely different from that of the guards, for he is wearing the Spanish-style doublet and trunk hose of black velvet heavily braided with vertical lines of gold braid. He wears a flat cap of black velvet decorated with pearls and a curling feather and over the doublet a short cloak edged with 15 rows of gold cord. The trunk, the trunk hose is slashed and padded and his muscular legs well displayed by leg hose of white satin. Henry's beard and mustache are closely trimmed. And as he passes Thomas, he gives him a long, Thomas gives him, well, wait a minute. And as he passes Thomas, he gives him a long, slow searching look before he smiles down at the two children with him. The child on his right is a little boy of five, rather pale and ill looking. Thomas guesses he must be the Dolphin Francis. The girl on the king's left is a little older and is tall and graceful with auburn hair and a clear complexion. She chatters away happily to the king in French and Thomas realizes with a little shock that she is the Queen of Scotland, Mary Stuart. The lady behind with black hair and Swathy, swathy skin is the Queen of France, the Italian princess Catherine de Medici. She needs plenty of space to walk, for her skirt is stiffened out with a Spanish farthingale uh, to a width of five feet or more. Her costume is more colorful than the king's with a close-fitting gold headdress, a high lace collar, and blue gown, square-necked with 
and with a tight bodice worn over an underdress of pink. This shows through in a V-shaped panel at the front and at the sleeves, which are trimmed with enormous ermine cuffs. The dress materials are covered with a lattice work of gold braid and embroidery. Behind comes another magnific magnificent figure, a tall, elegant man in the scarlet robes of a cardinal of the church. With him is an elderly lady, several um, severely dressed in black with a close-fitting cough. She walks very erect, and her piercing gaze seems to miss nothing. As the possession passes along, Thomas's cousin whispers snippets of information. The little boy is, of course, Francis, whom Mary is to marry when she grows up. The cardinal is Mary's uncle and tutor, the cardinal of Lorraine. And the old lady is Mary's grandmother and mother of both the cardinal and the queen mother of Scotland. When the procession has gone by, Thomas's cousin takes him round the palace to see more wonders. Thomas's head is reeling by the time by the end of the day, and he is not at all surprised to learn that there are 57 cooks busy in the royal kitchens. It is a relief when at last he is ready to set out for the lodging his cousin arranged for him. First, however, he has to see the mounting of the guard. The cousins stand in an angle of the courtyard while the uh, Scottish guard comes to take over the duty of the guarding of the palace during the night. Torchlight flickers on helmets, halberds, and bearded faces as they step into line, and Thomas listens attentively as the guard commander calls the roll. He hears many family uh, familiar names, Hamiltons, Grants, Montgomery's, Gordons, Nesbitt's, Humes, Douglas's, Rollifords, uh, Moncliffe's, Stewart's, Ogilvy's, and Crawford's. They are all gentlemen of good birth serving in the Scottish Guard. Um, uh, serving in the Scottish Guard is the greatest honor they can receive. Thomas wonders if he will ever join the company and win honor and renown. Perhaps he will be one of the guards when Francis and Mary are crowned king and queen. This is one of the greatest days for the commander or first captain of the Scottish Guard. For he stands nearest the king at the coronation and receives the richly jeweled coronation robe as a reward. The roll call ends and there is a great jangling of keys as the guard commander leads his men off to lock up the palace gates. The torch bearers march off too and Thomas pulls his cloak tightly round him as he limps away to dream of the future. Thomas comes to see his ambition fulfilled over the years. In the meantime he learns how to mix in the company of great people and how to hold his own in the presence of kings, queens, nobles, courtiers, statesmen, and politicians. Most important of all, he learns the art of soldiering in court and camp and in the fighting that takes place down on the Scottish, uh, Spanish border. By the age of 24, he has won the reputation of being brave, clever, and trust trustworthy and his name is entered on the muster roll of the Scottish Guard as Thomas Caffert, uh, or Crawford, C-R-A-F-F-O-R-T. There are many other Crawfords, or Crawfords, on the list also, 
The French clerks always have great difficulty with Scottish names. The same muster roll shows Andrew Cunningham as Andre Conningham, C-O-I-G-U-A-N. John Winston as Jehan Winston, V-I-N-S-T-O-N. And Thomas Ingalls as Thomas Hingle, H-I-N-G-L-E. There are 60 men-at-arms on the roll and 80 archers as well. In their company, Thomas learns how to give and take orders, how to plan a campaign, how to weigh up the the uh, wreck and strong points of a weak and strong points of a walled town or castle, and how to lead in a battle or skirmish. It is a splendid life, and all that Thomas ever wished for. But it comes to an end too soon with the death of Henry the Second. Strangely enough, it is the son of the commander of the Scots Guard who accidentally kills King Henry II. Henry is a great athlete and sportsman, and one of his favorite sports is jousting. Thomas never forgets the terrible day when the accident took place at the end of the day of tournaments. Just as the sport is in ending, Henry challenges the commander's son to another joust. At first, Gabriel Montgomery refuses, fearing perhaps that the king might be tired. He himself is a tall, tough, vigorous young man. In the end, he agrees, and they couch their lances and charge down the tilt yard. The courtiers watch with great interest. Both Montgomery and Henry II are skilled jousters, and so covered with heavy armor that the worst they might expect is a few bruises if they are not from the saddle. Now, uh, my minister at at our church, his last name is Montgomery, Uh, his ancestor was this Gabriel Montgomery, I think who uh, actually killed King Henry II in this joust. Of course, it was an accident, though, so don't blame him. (laughs) There is a crash, and each man breaks his lance on the other's shield. That is the aim of the sport, and the courtiers applaud. Then Henry falls forward over the high plummel of his horse's saddle. Splinters from Montgomery's lance have flown up under his visor, and he collapses senselessly as the charger excuse me as the charger finishes the run. He never recovers consciousness and dies in a few days with his court physicians and his Scots guards standing helpless round the huge four poster bed. Laird of Jordan Hill. Mary Stewart marries the Dauphin in 1558 at the age of 18. She is Queen of France as well as Queen of Scotland, but only for a very short time. A few months after their marriage, Francis II falls ill and dies within a week. In 1560, Mary decides to return to Scotland. Catherine de' Medici's second son is now king, and there is no place for Mary at court. Many Scots return home with the queen, and among them is Thomas Crawford. During Thomas's 12-year absence from Scotland, a big change has taken place. Most of the Scots have turned from the Roman Catholic faith and have become Presbyterian. When he reaches home, he discovers that this change in religion, known as the Reformation, is going to alter his life enormously. A few days after his return, Bartholomew, the Roman Catholic priest of the Church of St. Mary in Dumfries, um, comes to see him. Thomas greets the old man with respect, sorry to see how time and worry have aged him. Bartholomew, for his part, is greatly impressed 
by the change in, in Thomas. The pale, limping boy he remembers has changed into a bronzed, bearded soldier. Bartholomew quickly comes to the point of his visit. Years before the Crawford family had gifted the estate of Jordan Hill to the church, now the archbishop is gone and no one knows who is to govern the church lands. And Bartholomew wishes to go into retirement. He is now sure that Thomas is the most suitable man to take over the estate. And without more ado, he passes over a bulky parchment, the title deeds of the lands of Jordan Hill. Thomas can hardly believe his good fortune. Instead of being a penniless, penniless younger sold son with nothing to his credit but a good name and a ready sword, he is now a landed gentleman, Thomas Crawford of Jordan Hill. He realizes that he will have to work to keep his land. There are plenty of wealthy and powerful men who have their eyes on church lands. And if any great noble or royal favorite takes a fancy to Jordan Hill, uh, Thomas will lose it. A court of law could easily be persuaded that Thomas has no real right to the land. What he needs is the backing of some great nobleman who will help to defend his rights, and Thomas has to make himself known in Scotland. The next year or two passed peacefully enough with the Earl of Moray looking after most of the affairs of Scotland. Thomas looks after his estate and takes an interest in the affairs of, the, of church and government. He also marries. It is of little use winning new lands if he has no son to inherit from him. And besides, he has taken a fancy to Marion, daughter of Sir John Cocohorn, uh, C O L Q U. H-O-U-N, of Luss. Uh, now that he has lands of his own to support a wife and family, he is a worthy suitor. And his, his horse soon learns the windings and turnings of the country road that runs by the shores of Loch Lomond, Marion's home. Thomas's first child is a daughter, also named Marion. This means he needs to support the support of a great noble more than ever. As he, as he still has no male heir, and a number of people covet the lands of Jordan Hill. Just after Marion's birth, Thomas has, Thomas has another stroke of good fortune. One of his relatives, the Earl of Lennox, is allowed to return to Scotland. His son, Henry Stewart, Lord Darnley, is to marry the Queen. Matthew Stewart, Earl of Lennox, is just the master that Thomas is seeking. Thomas is not only his relative and a Lennox man, but a trained soldier and a courtier. The Earl wants servants like Thomas Crawford to carry out his biz businesses for him, for the lands of Lennox are widespread and there are all sorts of duties to undertake. Thomas soon becomes one of the Earl's factors, land agents, along with John Houston and Archibald Crawford. And after a short time, he is selected as the Earl's deputy, second only to the Earl's chamberlain, John Cunningham of Dumscrossel. D-R-U-M-Q-U-H-A-S-S-I-L. The Earl writes a letter which gives Thomas the right to act in his place. It reads, Be yet kind to all men by the present letter that we, Matthew, Earl of Lennox, have made, constituted, and ordained our well-beloved a uh, servitor and friend, Thomas Crawford of Jordan Hill, our very lawful, undoubted, and irrevocable agent factor, 
Aaron Barron and Special Messenger. <clears throat> the letter goes with Thomas on many journeys up and down the country to law courts and council chambers in Edinburgh to grim castles and remote country houses. Some of the missions are secret and dangerous, for the Earl has many enemies, and it is just as well that Thomas knows that Thomas knows how to guard his tongue. Civil War. For a while, Mary Stewart and her husband, Lord Darnley, get on well together, but they finally quarrel bitterly and separate. There are new rumors that Darnley is trying to kidnap the baby Prince James and put Mary off the throne. Thomas supports Darnley in his quarrel with Mary because Darnley is the Earl of Lennox's son. Thomas knows that Darnley may be in danger if Mary suspects the Earl of Lennox of plotting to seize Prince James. It is partly for this reason that Thomas is worried when Mary visits Darnley, who is lying ill in Glasgow. He is even more concerned when on visiting Darnley himself, he learns that Mary has persuaded her husband to return to Edinburgh, where he is to stay in Craigmiller Castle. His fears are indeed justified, for a few weeks later, he hears the news that Darnley is dead. The house he was staying in in Kirko Field was blown apart in, great, in a great explosion, but his body was found strangled in the garrison. I mean, in the garden. The chief suspect is the Earl of Bothwell, and many people are sure that Mary was in the plot to kill Darling when they hear that Mary and Bothwell are married. Now, I have my own opinion on that, too. Um, there, there was uh, some history that said that Bothwell raped Mary and forced her to marry him. And he killed Darnley because he wanted to marry Mary. Now, I don't know, but that's one. That's one of the uh, uh, explanations for it. But some people think that Mary was in on killing Darnley. I'm not sure. But anyway, the Scottish lords are horrified. <laughs> and raise an army which meets the Queen's forces in battle at Carberry Hill. Here, here Mary surrenders and is taken off as a prisoner to Loch Levin Castle. Meanwhile, the baby James is declared King of Scotland and the Earl of Moray is made regent. These are bitter days for Thomas and he has to endure a double sorrow for his young wife Marion dies. He does not have much time for mourning, however, for he is very soon called upon to serve the Earls of Lennox and Moray in their war against Mary's friends. The real fighting begins when Mary escapes from Loch Levin Castle and crosses over into Hamilton to collect an army. She has many supporters from Argyle, and from the Hamilton country, uh, and she decides to head for Dumbarton Castle. The Earl of Moray is much surprised by Mary's move, but is too. But he too gathers an army, and marches to Langside, where he defeats Mary's forces. She, by now desperate, flees to England to seek help from Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth does not, however, does not help, however. Instead, she says that Mary must try to clear her name. Now, um, I know that in movies, they have Mary and Queen Elizabeth meet each other, but in history, uh, Mary Queen of Scots and Queen Elizabeth I never met each other in person. So that's just a... A little side there they never met each other okay Elizabeth does not help however 
Instead, she says that Mary must try to clear her name. A special commission is set up to look at the evidence which the Scottish lords have gathered together. They find a silver casket containing letters said to prove Mary knew of the plot to kill her husband. One of the letters was supposed to have been written on the night that Mary went to see Darnley in the old uh, maze or man's M-A-N-S-E in Glasgow. <clears throat> Thomas has to go down to Westminster to tell his story of what happened. The journey made in December of 1568 is long and uncomfortable. Swathed in heavy riding cloaks, their leather boots pulled well up and their hat brims drawn down against the snow and the rain. The party set off from Edinburgh, following the main road down the coast. Even in the summer, the road is no more than a track worn by the passage of men and animals. On low ground, it becomes a sea of mud. Set here and there with, with, um, set here and there with, with breaking stones put down to fill the deeper holes as they go the riders have to pick their way carefully among pools of mud or frozen ruts. They pass through the old boroughs of Haddington and yes, Haddington and Dunbar and out on the high wild. Coldingham Moor from Berwick, they head for Newcastle and the south. But they find the <clears throat> English moors no warmer than the bleak, desolate Scottish moors. It is just as cold when they reach the flatlands of the southeast, with bitter winds sweeping over the marshes. They meet very few people. Nobody travels in winter unless he has to, and Thomas is heartily glad when they reach London. After nearly 14 days in the saddle, he is used to dealing with great men and is not overawed by the English noblemen who make up the commission. They ask him what happened when Mary went to see Darnley to try to find out if Mary really had plotted her husband's death. Thomas has thought out his words very carefully. He replies, The king, Darnley, asked me what I thought of his voyage the plan to go to Edinburgh. I answered that I liked it not, because she took him to Craig Miller, for if she had desired him with herself, she would have taken him to his own house in Edinburgh, the palace of the Holyrood House. Therefore, my opinion was that she took him away more like a prisoner than her husband. He answered that he thought little less himself. Notwithstanding, he would go with her and put himself into her hands and besought God to have mercy on both of them. Mary's guilt is very clear to Thomas, but the commissioners are not so sure. They weigh up all the evidence and decide that Mary's guilt is not proven. They cannot decide whether she is guilty or not. Even so, Elizabeth will not let Mary go, and the Earl of Moray continues to be regent of Scotland. The country is far from peaceful. However, Moray has many enemies among the Roman Catholics of the Highlands and, the, and Southwest, and among other Scots who won't marry back again as queen. Soon there is bitter civil war between the followers of Mary and the supporters of the regent. Mary's men <clears throat> still hold two of the great royal castles, Edinburgh and Dumbarton. The regent tries first to take Dumbarton Castle, which is his chiefly worry, which is his chief worry. 
The governor of the castle is a Hamilton and a friend of Mary, and he is able to stop all ships sailing up and down the Clyde. Moray tries to starve the garrison out in January of 1570, but French ships sail in at the last minute bringing supplies of food. It is the regent's last chance. For a few days later, he is shot down by James Hamilton of Bothwell, Bothwell Hague while riding through the streets of Lithingale. The new regent is Thomas's master, the Earl of Lennox. Queen Elizabeth advises John Cunningham and Thomas Crawford. Together, they begin to work out a plan to take the castle on the night of March 31st, 1571. Capturing the castles. Thomas knows, <clears throat> Thomas knows Dumbarton Rock and the castle pretty well, but he must exact information if the attack is to be successful. He passed word around among followers, and finally he finds the man he wants a soldier who once served in the castle. This man left the garrison after a quarrel in which his wife was accused of stealing and is not and has now a grudge against the keeper of the castle. Thomas talks the Thomas talks the climb over with his guide, working out how many ladders they will need to reach a shallow ledge in the cliffs where a tree grows out of the rock face. They decide to climb the steep part of the rock, known as the Beck, because of the sentries will never ex accept an attack, expect an attack from that side. Next, he chooses a hundred men from the small army who followed the Earl of Lennox. He picks them with care. <clears throat> they must be bold and experienced fighters with good heads for heights. A knowledge of firearms and enough sense to keep their mouths shut until the attack is over. At the same time, he collects together a, the scaling equipment he will need, ladders, ropes, and iron hooks to throw over the battlements. The men gather in Glasgow an hour before sunset. John Cunningham has already set off with a troop of horsemen to prevent <coughs> anyone giving news to the garrison. John finds that, he, he, that most of the garrison troops are drinking in the taverns of Dumbarton, and he has no difficulty in posting his horsemen to cut off the castle from the mainland. Excuse me while I take a sip of water. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Thomas leads <clears throat> Thomas leads his hundred men at a steady pace until they reach the hill of Dombeck. Just over a mile from the castle. Here he halts them and explains what they are to do. Each man is to tie his hagbit. I don't know what that is, a hagbit, but it's H-A-G-B-U-T on his back so that his arms are free and that they are to follow the man in front in a single file. Thomas and the guide will go in the lead. By now, the night is pitch black and misty. He orders them to fasten ropes to the ladders and hold fast to them so that they cannot go astray, for they are to cross dangerous and difficult country. There are ditches, uh, crevices, and streams ahead. They pick up the ladders and set off again, holding on to the ropes. <coughs> Thomas then follows the guide closely, whispering orders to the man behind. He, in turn, warns the man behind when the tr track is dangerous. The most difficult part 
is at Kruggy's Burn, which is bridged only by a tree trunk uh, stretched out over the deep water. Gradually, they work their way round until they are on the far side of the rock under the bricks. They loose the others together, leash the others together to make a tall scaling ladder, 60 rungs high, and lay it carefully so that it points up, up the cliff face to the outgoing tree and the ledge. The ladder is not long enough. 20 feet, six meters of rock face lie between the top rung of the ladder and the tree. Thomas looks at the guide and points upwards. The man nods and they loop the coils of rope around their shoulders. They will have to try to reach the tree by climbing the cliff. Thomas will never forget the ascent. Groping his way up the wet rungs of the ladder with the damp mist swirling about him, testing the lashes, which bind the ladder tops and climbing higher and higher. <laughs> the ladder, ladders are very shaky, but at least they give proper hand and footholds. Soon he and his companions are inching their way up the rock itself, feeling for finger holds and cracks in the rock. They press their bodies against the cliff face, uh, starting upwards to find a grip, stretching upwards to find a grip, and then cautiously change their weight from foothold to foot handhold. There are uh, their one fear is that a sentry overhead might hear their approach, but no one hears. At last, they reach the ledge. Quickly, they tie the ropes to the tree and lower them to their companions below. One by one, they reach the ledge, while Thomas and the guide scout the way ahead. Though they have scaled the steepest part of the rock, they still have a long climb ahead. Daylight begins to break before, <coughs> before the last big stretch of rock has been climbed so extra care is needed. There is a terrifying moment when a man collapses from some sort of fit as he is climbing one of the ladders. The whole attack might have been discovered, might have been discovered then, but Thomas, more than ever thankful for his pieces of rope, climbs up to the unconscious man and coils the rope around both ladder and man fastening him firmly to the rungs. Then he shins down and swings the ladder over so that the soldier is hanging from the underside. Then comes the moment they have waited for. They swarm up the ladder and over the battlements. The sentry sees them and cries out. But at that moment, a cloud of mist spreads over the top of the rock, blotting out the dawning light. It gives the attackers just the time they need to carry out Thomas's plan. As the men of the garrison come running out from their beds, unarmed and unprepared, some of Thomas's men open a covering fire with their hag butts. I guess that uh, opening fire, I guess a hag butt is some kind of a uh, gun or something. Uh, three of the garrison fall dead and in the meantime, the rest of the attackers seize the cannon. They swing the muzzles, muzzles of their guns around so that they point at the soldiers of the garrison. Um, <clears throat> some manage to leap over the walls and escape into the mist. mist. The rest surrender immediately. Dumbarton Castle is captured. Mary's supporters have no intention of giving up. There is still the castle of Edinburgh, um, defended by the great soldier Kirk Ka Caldy, Kirk Caldy of the Grange, who has gone over to her side. The regent's men raid Edinburgh in July, and Thomas gains more fame by leading his band of soldiers 
in a skirmish in Galilee <clears throat> against the Earl of Huntley's troops. He is given the right to add a motto to his coat of arms, God show the right. Already he has been awarded the honor of showing Dumbarton Castle on the Crawford Arms, and in addition, he has been promised lands and money once the fighting is over. Let me take another sip of water. Sorry, this is a long one. <clears throat> okay. Kill Cadley, <clears throat> Kirk Cowdy is not content to sit in Edinburgh Castle and wait to be attacked. In September, <clears throat> he learns that all the enemy, enemy leaders are in the borough of Sterling, and he sends out a raiding party to capture them. <clears throat> if he succeeds, Mary will be Queen of Scotland once more. About 300 raiders gallop into Stirling at 5 in the morning on September 4th. They make no secret of the attack but race through the streets shouting their war cries, God and the Queen, a Hamilton, and all is ours. They know exactly where to find each leader, and in a few minutes they seize the earls of Glencairn, Argyle, Castleys, Sutherland, and Eglinton, and capture the regent, the Earl of Lennox. Thomas is the first to awake. He runs to warn the garrison of the castle, and with other gentlemen, he races down to the city gate. They are just in time to rescue the captured earls, but too late to save Lennox. The man who sees the regent, Captain Cater, has shot him rather than let him go free. Thomas helps to carry the wounded earl up to the castle, but he dies soon after. Thomas has lost a good friend and master, but there is little time for sorrow. Before long, he is leading forays into the great forest round Hamilton, and there are desperate fights and hand-to-hand -hand encounters all through 1572. On one occasion, Hamilton, the Hamiltons ambush him and eight of his troops are killed. Most of the others are captured, and Thomas has a hard time escaping himself. Gradually, Mary's supporters are worn down, and in May 1572, they decide to attack Edinburgh Castle. Thomas is one of the captains who helps plan and take part in the siege. They all realize the Edinburgh Castle is too carefully guarded to be taken in the same way as Dumbarton Castle. They also remember the lessons of the Battle of Pinky, and they advise the two regents, they advise the new regent, the Earl of Morton, to, <clears throat> to borrow, borrow artillery from the Queen of England. The guns arrive on April 25, 1573, and are three shiploads of them. And they include a cannon roll, an iron monster weighing 8,000 pounds, which fires a 60-pound cannonball. There are also four single cannons each, weighing 7,000 pounds, firing 40-pound cannonballs, nine smalls, uh, Carvinans and four potters used to fire uh, hollow shells full of explosives. In, in addition, there are many smaller brass cannons and some artillery which has, from, which has come from the castles of the Earls of Argyle and Buckley. Um, the besieges set the cannon in place. Besiegers set the cannon in place during the nights of May 12th, 13th, and 14th in preparation for the bombing on May 17th. It takes five days of battering at the walls before the cannons has its effect. Has its effect. 
first David's tower and part of the wall come crushing down and two days later the portico's tower and the Wallace Tower collapse, bringing down another great chunk of the wall. It can only be a matter of time now. Once the castle walls are breached, the besiegers can break through. Kirk Caldy's Kirk Caldy's beats off attacks from May 26 to t- to the 29th. But once the blockhouse is taken, he has to surrender. Mary's supporters are beaten at last. <clears throat> After the fighting, for Thomas, the siege of Emberl Castle is the last great battle, and he can now attend to his own private affairs. One day he receives a letter from King James the Sixth of uh, Scotland and King James the First of England. It is written in careful boyish handwriting, and it reads, Captain Crawford, I have heard such report of your good service done to me from the beginning of the wars against my unfriends. <laughs> As I shall someday remember the same, God willing, to your great contentment. In the meanwhile, be of good comfort and wait until that time with patience. Uh, Being assured of my favor, farewell, September 15th, 1575. Your very good friend, James R. Thomas is given rewards which will keep him in comfort for the rest of his life. He is to get a, a pension of 200 pounds per year as well as lands and corn mills in Partick, uh, P-A-R-T-I-C-K. He also takes over a new house in Glasgow and marries for the second time to Janet Kerr, the daughter of a landowner of Monkland. In 1577, he is made provost of Glasgow, governor. He is made governor of Glasgow. Thomas and Janet have three children, Hugh, Cornelius, and Savannah. Hugh is to inherit the precious lands of Jordan Hill, and his sons will carry on their grandfather's career of soldiering. Lawrence Crawford will fight in the Thirty Years' War in 1618 through 1648 as a lieutenant colonel in the Swedish Army. Before he joins the Roundhead side as a major general in the Civil War against Charles I, Thomas Crawford will become a colonel in the Russian Army. Daniel Crawford is to become a lieutenant colonel in the British Army until the Civil War breaks breaks out. He then fights on the side of the Cavaliers and afterwards to serve He is to serve the Tsar of Russia. Once as a, uh, first as a major general and then as governor of the city of uh, Smolensk, S-M-O-L-E-N-S-K. Thomas sells his Glasgow house to uh, Lord Boyd in 1887 and he goes to live in Renfrewshire at Kilburnie, where his ancestors come from. He dies there in 1603 and is buried in Kilburnie Churchyard in a solid looking tomb he designed for himself. A great slab with his name carved on it lies on the ground beside the tomb. The motto he won at Galilee is carved on the wall inside the church. God show the right. Hope y'all enjoyed. See you back soon. Bye.